So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Dunn. I am the uh, Director of Business Solutions at TCIA. I want to thank you all for joining us in the next topic in a series of webinars TCIA has hosted on important issues for your business related to COVID-19. I'm pleased to introduce our presenters for today's topic on the neuroscience of safety. Uh, we have Ed Carpenter, who is the CEO and President at Nats. Ed has an AS in Boriculture from Stockbridge and a BS from Urban Forestry from UMass Amherst. And he's also an OSHA and ANSI SME qualified lead instructor and facilitator. Uh, also presenting today is Amanda Carpenter, who is the Vice President and Health and Wellness Director at Nats. Amanda has an MS and Doctorate in Physical Therapy and a BS in Health Science. Also serving as a panelist today is Aidan O'Brien, who is the Advocacy and Standards Manager at TCIA, and Amy Teetrout, who is the Senior Vice President of Corporate Engagement at TCIA. Uh, we are gonna keep everybody muted as we have done in the past, except for the panelists. You will have the ability to ask questions anytime during the presentation by clicking on the Q&A icon and typing them in, and we will try to get to the, as many as we can in the allotted time. With that, I'll turn it over to Aiden to get things started. Thanks, Tom. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Aiden O'Brien. I'm TCIA's Advocacy and Standards Manager. And a major part of my role is ensuring uh, TCIA's members have all the information and resources they need on government policies that come out of Washington, D.C. And so as I see it, the COVID-19 pandemic has made this role as important as ever. Um, as the government responds to all of the unique uh, economic and public health challenges this virus brings. And so already um, we've seen nearly unprecedented change in some of these laws, uh, tax, loan, family leave policies um, are all some we've seen and um, more is sure to come as Congress uh, continues working into the summer. And so as a brief update on this front, um, the SBA earlier this week released the Paycheck, Paycheck Protection Program loan forgiveness application. Um, you can find that posted on TCIA.org. Uh, but that's something we encourage our members who took advantage of that program to take a look at. Um, and so if you have questions on these topics, we have a TCI has a whole series of webinars and resources um, that's posted on our website. Um, we're still updating all of those resources regularly, um, both from TCI and across the industry. So we highly encourage our members to take a look at that. And uh, before we begin, um, I want to encourage everyone to feel free to put any questions they have on the presentation into the Q&A down at the bottom of the screen, and we'll hopefully have some time at the end to answer all of your questions. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over Ed Carp to Ed Carpenter to get us started today. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Aiden. And special thanks to TCIA for hosting this uh, very important topic. And thanks for all the participants on the Friday before Memorial Day for tuning in. Uh, whether you're at work or at home, we want to make sure that we give you some great information in this presentation. Oh, can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Did you catch that first part or did, was it not going? I think we might have missed the first part, Ed. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, thanks everybody for tuning in on a Friday, especially the Friday before yeah. Memorial Day. We got that part? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yep. thank you. Uh, just my, uh, my screen's not advancing for some reason. There we go, all right. Special thanks also to all of our Safety Alliance <laughs> partners who make our training programs possible. Uh, their support's been great, especially through this COVID pandemic. It's been uh, much needed and very much appreciated. So at Nats, uh, we believe our why, we believe in empowering individuals with the resources needed to safely perform their jobs. So at the end of the day, everyone returns home safely to their friends, family, and loved ones. That is important now so more than ever. Uh, nobody wants to go to work and have fear of not making it home at the end of the day in the same condition. So safety, we now have a global platform to talk about it. As Arborist, we've been managing risk for a long time. We have a lot of tools in our toolkit to do that. And what we're gonna be focusing on here today is really understanding a little bit more about the neuroscience behind that, how we make decisions, how our bodies function, especially when they're under a stressful environment or stressful, stressful conditions. So again, about me, thank you guys so much. Uh, President of Nats, I'm also an OSHA authorized trainer. I'm also a certified heart math trainer. We're gonna explain a little bit more about what heart math is, but I've been in the industry for about 23 years. I'm extremely passionate about safety. Uh, I've, I've, we, we get often called in to investigate accidents, take a look and see root causes of 
what's ultimately driving decision making? Why did this happen in the first place? And oftentimes training as an intervention tool, it can be a great tool, but it's something that works best prior to an accident happen. If there's an accident that takes place, training's not gonna help them at that point. We can come in and do a root cause analysis, try to peel apart those factors. And that's really what led us down this path to understand a little bit more about the neuroscience. I'm gonna turn it over to the doc. Thanks, Ed. Um, I'm Dr. Amanda Carpenter. I also happen to be Ed's uh, sister. So we have been, we grew up in uh, the logging industry in the Southern Adirondacks and our father was a, a cutter on a family logging business. So I've been in and around the industry my entire life. Um, and as Tom mentioned, I'm a doctor of physical therapy. Uh, my specialty for the past 20 years has been in orthopedics and working with injured athletes and injured workers. So I've had the opportunity to make some observations and dig in and look at the research of, you know, what happens with an accident and what leads somebody to the point where there's a breakdown that occurs. Um, uh, as Ed mentioned, I'm the health and wellness director of NATS and the, the vice president as well. So over the years, all of my knowledge um, in discussions of safety have kind of been behind the scenes. And in 2019, we decided to, to make them a part of NATS. Really with everything that I do and all of my background, I help people optimize their human performance. So on the biochemical level, on the biomechanical level, and then also on the bioelectrical level, which is really the nervous system. So bringing my background um, with athletes into the industry, we really talked a lot about the piece of the missing piece of safety being neuroscience. And so I joined NATS officially last year, 2019, to kind of um, enhance what we do offer. So thank you, happy to be here. So quick disclaimer, we cannot teach anybody anything. We can only make them think. So we just want to share some information, share some resources. It's going to be a very content rich presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and apologize. I do have a newborn at home that was just born a few months ago. So you may hear a little bit of uh, noise in the background there. Uh, my wife has been doing an amazing job keeping her through this COVID pandemic. We will provide resources and I believe everybody's going to receive a copy of this recording at the end as well. Amanda, do you want to go ahead and take this? Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to present some concepts um, around safety related to human performance that might be new or different. We just really want to plant the seed today. So if, if you're really wanting to understand the science aspect of it, don't worry about it. Just know that the seed has been planted. Grab onto what re resonates. Leave the rest. There's plenty of resources out there that we can share with you. So I just want to remind everybody, don't get buried in the, the heaviness of the science and the content. So we do have some objectives that we want to cover. We're going to talk about our approach to safety as an organization. We're going to define what cognitive dissonance is. That may be a new concept for some folks. We're going to review accidents in the arboriculture industry, the trends. We're going to try to understand why accidents occur from a root cause analysis. Why neuroscience and safety? Like, why are we presenting this topic? What is HRV or what we call heart rate variability? What is coherence? And then we're going to do a review at the end. So buckle your seatbelts. It's going to be action packed. We got a lot of content we're excited to share with everybody. Here we go. <clears throat> so getting to the heart of safety, we really started to try to look at through root cause analysis, you know, what are these core elements or these key performance indicators when it comes down into safety? We're going to take a journey on this why, how, and what. So at Nats, we believe, we already talked about this statement, you know, we believe in, in ensuring everybody has the resources needed to do their jobs safely. Uh, safety is a personal thing. My version of safety may be different than another person's version of safety and often is combined with our life experiences, our training, our education, our background. There's a lot of factors that go in there. And what makes this industry great is just like the trees that we care for, it's diversity. So we really want to provide our perspective of what we think. How will we do this? We, we do this by focusing on leading indicators and applying principles of root cause analysis. By applying principles of root cause analysis, peeling it all the way back to that granular level. You know, what was the, what was the key issue here of why this accident took place? Anytime we've done this, often what we find is it's a series of factors. It's very difficult to boil it down to one key thing. So by understanding a little bit more of the neuroscience, it makes you think, makes you maybe engage some experts that have a little bit more expertise. Uh, but we want to sort of share, share down this path. And then ultimately what we do, we use scientifically validated technology and techniques to identify concepts and support our, these concepts with data. Our key safety performance indicators that we really have honed in on, and especially since Amanda has officially joined our team, worker health and wellness. 
a lot of people don't always correlate that with safety. They think, oh, I can do whatever I need off the job. I mean, I can drink beer and eat whatever as long as I'm working out when I'm at work. Yeah, you can, but there's some aspects that do impact you on the job site, some things that you need to consider. Proper equipment use. These, the, our equipment manufacturers and partners, they take a lot of time to engineer and make sure that things are being used appropriately. And then as soon as we get those user instructions, we open up the box, we throw them out, we just sort of use it how we want to use it, not necessarily how it was designed to be used. And then ultimately the worker's competency. How do we combine all of these aspects? This is really what we call the foundational elements of safety performance, these, these key performance indicators. So I want to Manage introduce sure. a concept. Um, of cognitive dissonance, the way that the brain takes on new information. Um, and I really just want to plant the seed. One of the reasons that training isn't always effective is because of this foundation, this cognitive dissonance. So what it is, is it's really a mental conflict that occurs when beliefs are, contra are contra contradicted by new information. So for example, a trainer comes along and tells somebody, this is how you use a chainsaw but their grandpa or their papa taught them how to use a chainsaw and that was their truth up to that point. So what then happens is this creates a conflict and that conflict activates areas of the brain involved in personal identity, emotional response, and really it's a threat as perceived, like, oh my gosh, I'm not as good as who I thought I was and there's a threat here. So it causes what we call an emotional trigger to go on. And when that brain's alarm goes off, that person feels threatened at a deeply personal and emotional level. So it causes them to shut down and no matter what you explain, they appear to be irrational. Like, what do you mean? You know, two hands on a chainsaw, safe use, the use of chaps. So I really understood this concept within the industry when I was observed my father and Ed having a discussion so over a chainsaw use so my father has never used chaps in his entire life he's a 72 two year old um you know retired logger and for him chaps were not necessary you can do it without his father had taught him how to use a chainsaw how to be safe and here comes his son along and tells him something different and i observed that happen over and over and i was like this is what's going on and then being around the industry for quite a while, it involved in a lot of trainings, I realized this is what sometimes is happening. So what can we do about it? We can just simply be aware and going back to that, never underestimate the power of planting a seed. I think, I think so many times training within our industry, you might not think you're having an impact, but sometimes you never know how you change somebody. In the moment they might've been triggered, but when that is de-escalated and they're thinking about it later, oh yeah, that does make more sense. So really never underestimate the power of planting a seed. When somebody appears to not be perceiving something that is so rational, this is oftentimes what's going on. So what we want to do too is take a look at uh, arboriculture, safety in arboriculture. You know, this is a very common modern work site. You know, it's an army of high vis. Everybody's got their PPE on. We want to be seeing those sorts of things. Those are identifying, hey, these are the right sort of actions and behaviors that may be taking place. You can look from a distance and identify that pretty quickly. Accident trends in the industry. There's some great resources that are out there. I'm not going to go into copious detail. This is a, an article from the Journal of Arboriculture put together by Dr. John Ball, a familiar name in this industry, Shane Vosberg and Tim Walsh, looking at a span of about 16 years of accident trends within the industry. Also, TCIA has phenomenal resources to track these accident trends. How are people getting injured? How are people getting killed? How are people uh, you know, not making it home at the end of the day? The industry is a high risk industry and a high hazard industry, but we can put safe control measures in place to not put ourselves in harm's way. I think it's up to the individual whether the job is dangerous or not, right? Yes, the hazard is there, but with appropriate controls, we can minimize that hazard. One of the key things on trends that has been taking place over the years is going all the way back to the early 60s, Z133, our safety standard, consensus standard put together by the industry for the industry, came along in 1968. Two years later, OSHA comes along in 1970 these trends have pretty much stayed the same. Now the numbers have, have varied, but the trends have pretty much stayed the same. Contact with an object, falls from height, exposure to a harmful environment, right? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. As an industry, we've really been challenged and we've really struggled and we now find ourselves in this space to where OSHA says, geez, we're, you guys are still continuing to have a high injury and risk rate. You know, we really want to put some better control measures in place and hence an OSHA standards being worked on for the tree care industry. So the trends for many, many years have stayed fairly consistent. 
the big challenge that we have is oftentimes as an industry, we tend to use fear to try to influence behavior, right? So don't do this. Don't stick your hand in the chipper. You know, to Amanda's point, don't cut yourself with a chainsaw. You know, we tend to focus on the don't. And, you know, growing up, my, my 72 year old father told me a lot of things to not do. And as a teenager, I found myself challenged and I said, oh yeah, well, watch me, you know, I'm going to do those sorts of things. So, you know, using fear to influence behavior, uh, it doesn't always work. It may work on the short term, but it might not have effects on the long term. Amanda, do you want to share a little bit about pro athletes? So there's a lot that we can learn through athletes. And in my 20 years of working with all sorts of different levels of athletes, one of the trends that I personally started to see is people were oftentimes stuck in their head right before the accident happened, right before they tore their ACL or they tore their rotator cuff. You know, what was going on in their life prior to that? And oftentimes if it's a high school athlete, they had a breakup with a girlfriend or, you know, something was going on. So I started to recognize that they're stuck in their head a bit. So obviously the nervous system influences our performance. And then if we just take a step back and look at professional athletes, they don't teach professional athletes to practice and imagine not making the basket. They have, they use visualization. So over and over and over, or that professional baseball player, you know, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to strike out, you know, they're not, they're not saying that. But the narrative that I was hearing of don't stick your hand in a chipper is very similar to don't go up there and strike out, you know, go up there and hit that ball. So, so emphasizing safe practices, but being careful of where we let the brain go. One of the things that science and research has shown us is when we focus on something, the brain doesn't always hear the don't aspect of it. And there is a visualization that occurs. So again, you know, do we need to slightly change the narrative? Is that maybe why some of the training is not working and we're seeing some of the same trends? So we really want to get down to what our aspect is, and this is Nat's, Nat's perspective of why do accidents occur. So if you break it down, they really fall into two categories, right? Accidents, you have an unforeseen hazard on the work site, right? The employer is supposed to provide training and such for the employees. Well, if they don't know the hazard, they can't identify the hazards, you know, that we have a risk there. And really when you break it down, it falls into two categories. Is there a human failure or is there equipment failure? <clears throat> right, that unforeseen hazard still exists human failure over here, equipment failure over there. And you can break down those even further as well. You know, is it a performance issue? Is it a training issue? Is it a lack of awareness, lack of knowledge? All of these factors at their fabric is human performance. And oftentimes in accidents, the narrative that I see is it comes down to a blame shame game. You know, someone did not do this or they did not do that. You know, what were they thinking? I cannot tell you how many accidents I've investigated to where that comes out, what were they thinking? And what we find out is the brain, right, in an accident-based situation, what were they thinking? They weren't thinking. They did not have access specifically to the parts of the brain. The frontal lobe was shut off, right? The door was closed. It's the equivalent of, you know, I'm at the airport and I'm heading down, I'm looking for my terminal. There's all these other terminals there, but I've got my terminal in mind. Well, if I need to actually go to one of the other terminals to take me to the destination of safety, in my terminal that I'm focused in on, you know, might not take me there, I, I find myself in a challenge situation. So, you know, oftentimes what were they thinking is a common narrative that we see. When we also apply root cause analysis, people typically only investigate to their level of expertise. So if I'm a climber or if I'm a bucket operator or an equipment manufacturer, I'm going to investigate down to whatever my level of expertise is, right? Cognitive bias, it's, it's human nature, those sorts of things happen. But oftentimes with accidents, they're complex events. It takes a series of things that cause them to build. It's very difficult to identify one core thing of what is that true cause, right? So our whole concept of getting to the heart of safety, it really takes a team of experts to effectively peel apart the segments of an accident because we're all gonna focus in on different things, right? Amanda with her health and wellness background, she's gonna focus in on that health and wellness aspect. For me, you know, applying industry standards in my work experience, I'm going to focus in on that. If there's some sort of an equipment issue, I may want to engage the manufacturer to focus in on that. Between all of those expertise, we can really better understand what the essence is and help better understand what the story is. So with that in mind, we're going to focus specifically on the neuroscience aspect of this. And at North American Training Solutions last year, uh, both Man and I became certified through a research institute out in California called HeartMath. Now, what the heck is this heart math? <laughs> heart math is a research institute. It's been around since the mid 90s. And really what they look at is the physiology that, of, of how the heart and brain communicate. And so we've been using here at NATS heart math tools and techniques, which are scientifically validated systems to teach individuals to access the intelligence of the heart 
to make better decisions in the moment and ultimately improve human performance and improve safety. We're gonna dig in a little bit more to the science and the how behind it. So again, they've been around for a while, over 397 plus uh, peer reviewed scientifically validated research studies, you know, no small uh, journals either, you know, the Journal of American Cardiology, the Journal of Psychology, they've been, their uh, methods and techniques have been researched not only by them, but also by research institutes from across the globe. We'd be happy to send any sort of links to folks. Also, if you go on natstraining.com, we have a web link up, the science of safety, You'll see a lot of links in there as well. But this is not just our opinion. This is actually vetted in, in, in stringent science. So basically, our, our bodies, we're energy systems. You know, a lot of us, we correlate our cell phones. If you don't plug your cell phone in, what happens? The battery dies. You know, we lose our connection. Right now, we lose our connection to tap into the Zoom call. We lose our connection to our loved ones. Well, if we don't think about our bodies as an energy system, if we don't take the time to unplug, which is really important going into the Memorial Day weekend and recharge our batteries, you cannot continue to use energy, use energy, use energy without having the system crash, right? Our energy expends and it can be, it can be renewed, but we have to take appropriate measures in order to renew it. So really this, this concept of resilience tied back to neuroscience and tied back to safety is more important now than ever. You watch all the national news channels and they're talking about resilience this, resilience that. What we specifically love is HeartMath's definition of resilience. Resilience as it's been traditionally applied to safety is the concept of bouncing back from. And that doesn't always have to be the case. That's like the accidents already happened, the injuries already happened, and now we've got to bounce back. But what about to sort of get folks to think differently, adapting in the face of stress, challenge, or adversity. And as tree care workers, we have to adapt in the face of stress all the time. Several weeks ago, oh my gosh, you know, now with this COVID situation, how do I keep my business going? How do I keep my guys safe? How do I keep, you know, folks out there doing things effectively? You don't have to wait until something bad happens. You can adapt in the face of. Also, this concept of resiliency and this concept of energy expenditure with practice and techniques, you can actually learn how to rebuild and, and, and maintain resiliency over time. So resiliency has four domains. I'm not gonna get into the details of all of them. They're the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual. When we're in the center of all those domains, we have what's called coherence. Also, some folks may know that is the flow state. Where we as humans tend to expend most of our energy is in this emotional domain, right? The thinking, the worries, the stress, especially right now. By having that worry, having that stress, it's the equivalent of we don't have the ability without clear techniques <clears throat> to plug our cell phone back in. The worry builds up, the emotion builds up, and all of a sudden our brain starts running off and thinking worst case scenarios. When we come in and we're trying to teach people safety concepts and we're identifying don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, right? It also enhances that and tends to enhance that negative narrative over time. So the emotional domain is where we spend most of the energy. You can actually measure these sorts of things as well. So here's a graph. We're going to take a look at the heart rate specifically. This is heart rate beats per minute. When the heart rate increases, also another key neuro function that happens, there's over 1400 neurochemicals that start to cascade in the body. But one core one that has caught a lot of focus recently is cortisol. Cortisol is a neurochemical that we need. It's, it's actually beneficial, but too much of it is not good, right? From a ba basic chemical standpoint, on average, cortisol has about a 12 hour half-life. So once you get it into the body, it's gonna stick around for a minute. So if my heart rate increases, cortisol starts to dump, right? All these other things start to also function and happen within my body, right? And without resiliency building techniques, the cortisol is going to stay there for a long period of time, right? We can take cortisol, but if we're under stress every single moment of every single day, it has these cascading effects that are not good for us long-term. We've got to learn how to manage that. So over time, our heart rate will start to decrease. We'll start to metabolize the cortisol out of our system. There's ways to actually improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of that taking place. We've got to have balance, right? Work-life balance we talk a lot about, right? We can't just spend all of our energy and not take the time to renew that energy. So life is all about balance. Uh, we've got to make sure that we have that, especially within our safety systems. I'm going to turn it back over to Amanda to explain a little bit about this concept of stress and performance. Yeah, so just to back up a little bit too, as far as the energy balance, oftentimes we think of energy or um, the world that I lived in with athletes was energy in, energy out as first calories of what I'm eating. So what I'm putting in my body and energy out, and we're oftentimes thinking of how physical am I being for the energy expenditure? What we oftentimes forget is using our brain, that big pig in our brain, in our uh, head, 
our brain spends a, a tremendous amount of energy. So we could be sitting still and we could actually be burning energy. Now it's not the equivalent of calories in, calories out. There's other reasons why it doesn't work from a weight loss standpoint, but that science isn't for here. So just thinking of you know calories in, that is not necessarily energy and the physical going out. Have you ever had the experience of somebody makes you mad and you start, you're just sitting there, but you start to feel your heart rate increasing tremendously? What I want you to start to think of is anytime your heart rate is elevated, regardless of the reason, the gas is on, I'm burning energy. Anytime I'm relaxed, my heart rate is slowed off, I'm oftentimes charging my battery. That's a way of, of kind of plugging in. So I want you to just, just start to look at that slightly differently. You know, is the gas on or is the brake on? Am I expending energy or am I using? And that's when it had mentioned that domain of emotional is where we lose most of our energy. If we get triggered and spend some time in our head and our heart rate is elevated, if we have an altercation with somebody and our heart rate stays elevated, we continue to burn energy. And that's what we're talking about. So the concept of stress as it relates to performance, there was some original research done back in the 40s with the invasion of Normandy within the, um, the military. And they looked at how hard can we push human performance. And the reference is right on the bottom of the slide, 1946 is when it was published. How much can we actually push human performance? And they documented, they collected information over the, the course of 58 days. And they made a lot of different observations. And we have access to that original research study and we kind of dug into that. What the HeartMath Institute has done is they've looked at additional research that has supported that same stress performance curve. Most of the research comes out of the military because that's oftentimes where they're trying to push human performance. So this curve has been repeated time and time again. Yes, you can only push humans so much. And when we do, when we do resilience building techniques, we can get a little bit more out of humans is what's been recognized. And the heart math as a tool has been found that we can actually make humans go for a little bit longer. So what this research so, shows is at the, the start of a challenge. So let's think of our we're going through COVID, the start of COVID, okay? We're all ready, we're kind of amped up on adrenaline a little bit and we embrace the challenge. We initially improve performance. Think of everybody within your organizations. We, we've got this, we're gonna take care of it. You know, initially we embraced it. And then we hit this period of maximum efficiency where we shifted operations. A lot of us that were out in the field took stuff online. Um, there were some shutdowns for some companies, but we kind of hit this period of maximum efficiency. But then what has moved, what, what we uh, have moved into is this hyper reactive stage. And I'm sure that each of you has observed this in and around your life is that people are starting to become overreactive and maybe a little bit of irrational behavior because we're starting to fatigue. We as humans are starting to fatigue. So what happens is that's a leading indicator. That reaction is a leading indicator to breakdown and breakdown is injury or illness. You can only push the human body so much until two things happen. One, I can't access my brain to think and two, I can't access my physical body for optimal performance and I'm gonna decrease my reaction speed and make mistakes. So the hard math techniques are a way of getting a little bit more out of a person before they crash. But well, the takeaway is at some point we're all gonna crash. Rebuild your resilience. Don't, don't follow the red line all the way down. So the way that we measure this, I'm gonna breeze through this, it's called heart rate variability. And heart rate variability is our heart is an electrical system. So we can actually pick up on the electric, uh, electricity and the electromagnetic fields coming off of the heart. So we always talk about heart rate and rhythm. If somebody has an arrhythmia problem or if somebody has a rate problem. So this heart rate variability is the rhythm of the heart essentially is the takeaway. When we have a poor heart rate variability, it is not in an ideal rhythm and we are burning energy. That's the takeaway. We can go through that in. So that just shows the heart rhythm. So heart-brain communication, this is what HeartMath has really brought to life. There's a lot of research out there, but HeartMath really made this public. The heart has its very own complex nervous system called the heart brain. And there is a whole area of cardiology called neurocardiology that is a specialty related to this outside of, of HeartMath. HeartMath has just brought it to public awareness. 
what they have noticed is the heart sends far more information to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. So what does that mean? That means there's signals coming from the heart that are going up to the brain to open up brain capacity. The patterns, what I just spoke about in the rhythm, the patterns of those neural signals in the heart affect brain centers that are involved in perception, um, our ability to access all the training we have ever had, our emotional experience, and then our, also our ability to self-regulate. So what we're saying here is the rhythm of the heart impacts opening the gates to give me access to my brain, which is where situational awareness is housed. So we talk about this concept and safety of situational awareness and being aware of something. The, the problem is we have to make sure that the signal, the pattern is there to open up that, that situational awareness. So this is just a, a slide that shows that an incoherent pattern, which is that really kind of rough line inhibits brain function. So it, call, it, it stimulates something called cognitive inhibition. Cognitive, I can't access my brain, inhibition. Now a good steady pattern of that gas break, a good rhythm facilitates brain function. So that's, that's the takeaway. So coherence is a state of optimal functioning between everything. So that rhythm is ideal so that the heart, the mind, the emotions are all in sync. They're working in sync, just like this boat. Everybody's paddling together. So physiologically, the immune system, the hormonal systems, and the nervous systems are all functioning in a state of energetic coordination. So heart rate variability and the pattern of heart rate variability affects 1,400 chemicals within the body. So Ed had mentioned cortisol, cortisol being one of them. So our nervous system has these two branches. The sympathetic, we've known that sympathetic is that stress response, that fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic. But I want to kind of reframe the way you think of that. There's times we need access to that sympathetic fight or flight nervous system. Just you know, showing up on site to do a tree care job, ascending into the tree, you have to be aware of everything that's going on. The, the nervous system is a bit heightened. So I want you to think of the sympathetic as the gas and the parasympathetic is the break. And we want a nice steady rhythm between the two. And that flow state between the two is called coherence. So we wanna access that flow state. An athlete doesn't wanna be relaxed because they're not gonna be able to access their brain. They also don't wanna be stressed. They wanna be in the flow state. And that's what coherence is all about. So this coherence is really the rhythm that's coming off of the heart. So this slide points out that emotions can actually impact that rhythm. Frustration, irritation, impatience, worry, anger, all of those emotions that we would kind of call uh, negative emotions, it's not that they're negative, it's that they're depleting. They, they drain the battery. So what they do is they eh, push on the gas and it creates this poor rhythm coming out of the heart. Now coherence, um, emotions such as appreciation, calm, patience, confidence, gratitude. There's a lot of practices where if we practice gratitude and appreciation, we know that that's good for us. This is why. There's a lot of studies that have shown that those renewing emotions impact these heart rhythms. So when we're looking at coherence, the research has shown that we get some really great, great outcomes. Enhances the ability to maintain composure during challenging times. Certainly beneficial in tree care. Improves family and social harmony. Good, good for at home. Reduces fatigue and exhaustion, awesome for tree care. Promotes the body's ability to naturally regenerate. So my ability to heal, if I'm that industrial athlete and I'm climbing all day, I've heard so many times in this industry, well, this industry is, is a rough industry. You can't last in it long. It's physically demanding, but it doesn't have to be because if each night we go home and we're resting and we're renewing and the body is laying down new muscle and new collagen, it doesn't have to be depleting at all. It's really the way that we look after our body. So we know that we can promote healing through having good heart patterns. Improves coordination and reaction times. That's a great safety feature. Enhances ability to think clearly and find better solutions, absolutely relative to safety. Improves ability to learn and achieve higher test scores, school-based, and increases access to intuitive intelligence. So the research has supported that when we have these good heart patterns, these are the outcomes. And this is why really I had a conversation with Ed. We were using this in athletes and we were using this in health. And I was like, we've got to bring this to the safety industry. So I just touched on the emotions and feelings that create this, those positive renewing emotions create this good pattern of coherence. So I know there's a lot of frustration going on in the world. 
but I think it was Buddha that said anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. When we're angry or we're stuck with, in a depleting emotion in our head, we're just draining our own batteries. We're affecting a hormonal cascade in our body and we're affecting ourselves. So the least we could do for ourselves is to shift in or attempt to shift over into a renewing emotion and start to charge the battery. But awareness allows for choice. So can we improve this coherence? It's really as simple as breathing. We can improve coherence and it's as simple as breathing. So there's a certain pattern of breathing called coherent breathing. And basically what that is, is an equal in breath and equal out breath, okay? Because we're putting pressure on the heart. So if we imagine we're breathing through the center of our chest area, we inhale for three seconds, we exhale three seconds. That's a coherent pattern. We inhale four seconds, we exhale four seconds, that's coherent. So inhale is sympathetic, exhale is parasympathetic. So we just want that equal, that's as simple as it is. So this shows a police officer who um, was trained in heart math techniques and these breathing techniques, and he's wearing a heart monitor. And so his heart rate raises a little bit when he's involved in this scenario and encountering an angry man. And of course it would elevate, he's gotta be in that awareness state. So what then happens is the scenario is over and that officer is safe back in, their, in his car, he's able to shift his breathing pattern and immediately lower his heart rate down and improve the rhythm, which stops that energy drain. If he stayed in that heightened awareness, he's draining his battery. The other thing here to know is in that heightened pattern, when cortisol starts to dump, it's that as well as other, you know, 1400 other neurochemicals, it starts to block off those nerve centers, right? So if you don't have a way to sort of counteract that, he learned how to use that balance of sympathetic, parasympathetic to shift the rhythm of the heart. And by shifting the rhythm of the heart, it's reprogramming or reprocessing those signals that are being sent to the brain. It's a trainable, learnable skill, and it's actually measurable as well. You can measure this. This is being measured with a heart rate monitor. There's some other tools that actually measure specifically HRV, which we'll talk about a little bit towards the end. Oh, actually, we'll talk about them right now. <laughs> so these HRV tools, uh, this is some tools put out by HeartMath. It's actually a little ear clip. And rather than looking at just heart rate, which is that beats per minute, again, that change beat to beat, you know, it, it, that is what creates HRV. Each time my heart beats, it's going to be a little bit different from one rhythm to the next. That HRV correlated over time, what heart math has done is they've mapped that and tied that back to certain emotions. And certain emotions can be very depleting on the body, as we spoke about, and some of them can be renewing. Right now, through this stressful situation, those depleting emotions, what are some ways that people process these depleting emotions? Well, most recently, we have a long weekend. People take time off people relax. People go out and have a beer with their buddies and their friends. You know, well, they used to pre-COVID. Pre Maybe they can have a Zoom cocktail or whatever, a happy hour. You know, the best time for us to recharge, sleep, right? Take time to sleep. And right now, so many people are not sleeping because cortisol is building up in the body and the body is in this fight or flight response to where they can't rest. They can't come down. Adrenaline is in, all these other neurochemicals are in. So you can measure it. That slide previously back. Again, you can measure this HRV. Um, and you can learn how to shift those rhythms. So again, we've covered a lot of content here. We just really wanted to talk about some of these key aspects. We're just gonna go back through and review what we sort of rapid fired to the group. Our approach to safety, we're really using root cause analysis and leading indicators to get to those safety performance indicators. Amanda walked us through what cognitive dissonance is when our beliefs are challenged. Oftentimes that can put us in fight or flight. So we gotta sort of understand and meet people where they're at. You know, what is it that's driving that belief, right? Really try to peel back the layers of the onion and use an empathetic approach. We don't need to necessarily agree, but with empathy, we need to seek to understand. We took a look at the accident trends, those contacts with an object, falls from height and exposure to a harmful environment, right? Those have been the same trends going all the way back to the late 60s. Why do accidents occur, the root cause, right? Was it a human failure? Was it an equipment failure? And even oftentimes equipment failure, if someone either made that, had to maintain it, or there was a systematic process, if that was not done, it comes down to that ultimate human performance. The neuroscience aspect, right? We're really focusing in about this, this connection between the heart and the brain and specifically understanding a little bit more about HRV or heart rate variability, that change beat to beat of how that influences neurosignals taken in through our body. What is HRV Amanda shared with us? 
uh, as I just spoke about here. And what is coherence, this optimal state of performance when I have my emotional, physical, mental, and spiritual domain all in sync? I'm in that flow state. It's almost like time stands still and I can just keep going. We see it on the tree care work site where people don't even have to verbally communicate. They can look and see and judge. I worked with one, one, a good friend of mine. We ran a small tree care business for a number of years. We didn't even have to speak on the job site. It was almost like you know, we were connected. He knew my next move and I understood his next move because we had a great state of coherence, right? It would connect us together. And can we ultimately improve coherence? Absolutely, we can improve coherence. So to learn more, we've got some more resources. You guys can check us out on social. You can follow along. We just launched, this is brand new on our website, the Neuroscience of Safety. It digs a little bit more into the details around this. There's also a lot of resources on there in regards to OSHA. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is OSHA, stress specifically, going all the way back to the early 90s when OSHA changed their record keeping rule, stress is actually a recordable workplace injury, right? This is something that is especially, uh, um, people need to think about through this whole COVID situation. The details, I'm not going to get into it now, but the details are on the, the website there. OSHA actually has letters of interpretation. There's some great publications that are put out by CDC, by NIOSH, by OSHA, a lot of great resources. I know TCIA has put some great resources together to understand the safety aspect of things and uh, go ahead and check them out on this neuroscience of safety. Also for folks that want to learn more, there's a free resource that you can access through our website. It's called the HeartMath Experience. It really lets you dive deep into the science behind this. We really just gave you a taste of it to understand a little bit. But if you want to learn more and specifically the techniques on how to train and improve your coherence, get into this optimal state, you can access this HeartMath Experience for, for free through, through our website, through the NAS website. We've got our blog. There's some great resources. Man has done a series of articles, her and some of her colleagues. You can check those out. And then coming up uh, June 2nd and 3rd, we actually have a, this is a four fee course that we're going to be running June 2nd and 3rd. It's called the Resilience Advantage. And what it is, is we dive super deep into the neuroscience and super deep really into the techniques on how can we maintain this state of optimal performance called coherence. This is important now more so than ever. There have been thousands of individuals from military professionals, health and wellness professionals, clinicians. We're the first ones that are bringing this science into the safety realm. Not even just tree care safety, safety in general, right? So we're launching this program June 2nd and 3rd. It's gonna be offered through an online training. There are two, it's about four hours each day. There's more details on the website. You can go and check it out. But we've seen a lot of uh, calls and requests for more training around this. And we'd be happy to provide that resource. And we're absolutely honored to be working with TCIA to be doing this, this session here today. Again, special thanks to our Safety Alliance partners for making this all possible. And huge thanks to, to Tom and Amy and Aiden and the whole TCIA crew. Big high five to you guys for everything you've been doing through this whole COVID pandemic. And thank you for allowing us to come into this platform and share some of this knowledge, share some of this information. And uh, what we'd like to do next is open it up to questions. Our contact info is on here. So Aiden, Tom, we're going to turn it back over to you. Yeah, we uh, definitely would like to encourage questions from anybody. Um, I got a question for you guys. I'll, I'll start, Please. Hopefully it'll, hopefully it'll start some uh, conversations. But, um, and, and it might be too early to tell yet, but have you guys seen any trends uh, with accidents that might have some underlying relationship to COVID-19 stress? It's, it's a great question. Yeah, we're actually involved in a, in a couple of accident investigations right now. Uh, I do see right now the ones that we're involved with, just my perspective, falls are up. And I think what's happening is folks are so hyper-focused. Until we sort of peel it back, you know, we won't know the true root causes yet. They're still active and they're open and I can't give all the details. But uh, I think people are so focused on COVID that, again, those nerve centers of the brain are sort of shut down. Trauma on the tree care work site is still the highest risk that anybody faces, right? Getting cut with a chainsaw, getting our arm caught into a chipper, you know, falling out of a tree. We still got to stay hyper-focused on that trauma. And what's happening is there's so much information coming at us, we don't know what to focus on. So back to Amanda's point there, you know, cortical inhibition sets in, cortisol enters the system and start to shut it down. I don't have a robust data set, Tom, in terms of uh, trends. We've talked to some of our insurance colleagues. Um, a big portion of the, the uh, industry was shut down. The Redscom folks were either on reduced work crews or what have you. So they didn't see a big uptick in terms of claims. I think that would be where I would look first to try to understand, you know, are there claims coming in? 
also OSHA data, you know, what's happening from a reportable standpoint. So what's compensable, you know, from workman's comp maybe, or, or through, you know, uh, insurance claims, and then also what's happening within OSHA. Do you, have you guys seen anything as well on your end, you know, you being the, the receiver of a lot of this information, I, I've, that's my perspective of what we've seen. Yeah. Aiden, I don't know if you have any, any uh, feedback on that. Yeah, I'm not sure. It might be um, a little too early just to see like what's the trend and what's just a one-off. So um, that's definitely something we'll be looking into as well because I mean, um, as we move forward, that's good information to have. Absolutely. So it does look like we have some questions. I don't know, Aiden, if you want to throw some of them out there. Yeah, so here's a good one. Um, how do we phrase the safety directive? For instance, using the don't do something model, how do you get to the positive reframe? Ooh, that's a, that's a great question. Nando, do you want to take that or do you want me to start? You can go ahead and start, yeah. Okay, yeah, so that, that's, that's probably the biggest challenge and it's safety across all industries, not just safety within tree care. So ultimately, what is it that you want people to do? The way that we've done that, I can only share my perspective, is by using the standards, by using things like the Z. You know, if it says do this, focus on doing that. Oftentimes presentations try to use, you know, the gore and the whore and all that sort of stuff to influence that. Just, you don't need it. Just identify and tell people, hey, this is the target you're trying to hit. Here's what success looks like. And then also, what are the elements that lead up to that success? For my two cents, keep it simple, you know, and, and that's a great way to, to reframe. I'm not sure if that answered the question or not. Man, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, no, I, that's, that hit the nail on the head. What does success look like? You know, that's what we have to focus on. We are so often in so many different narratives around everything. We don't define what success looks like. It's just from a communication aspect. So, you know, again, take it back to that athlete. What does success look like? Sinking that basket, you know, home run. What does success look like? Um, you know, the, the safety, safe use and describing what safe use looks like. Yeah, great what's, question. So I got another good one. So what's the best way or how can we promote uh, the state of well-being among a crew, um, especially if you don't want to dive into too much personal information or personal areas? Yeah. Amanda, do you want to take that one or you want me to? Yeah. Yeah, this is one that we've been working as an organization in all of our trainings is there's so much that you can capture um, at those, those tailgate safety get togethers in the morning. So really, you know, so many people think that, oh, it's personal, I can't ask. You can observe somebody's behavior. And you know what, people don't care what you know until you, they know you care. Just letting somebody know that you care. You know, hey, I noticed you've been a little bit down, you're tired. Also being hyper aware of like, oh, Ed's got an infant at home. All right, well, we know what that means. He's not sleeping well. So we're gonna kind of put Ed in a category. We don't have to talk about it, but we know we gotta kind of keep an eye on him. He might be a little bit sleep deprived. So really it's, it's everything that makes us human. What are we dealing with at home? Whose wife or mother has cancer? It's all those little things. Those are the conversations that start all of this. And really we didn't cover it in the presentation, but it all starts with us, you know, focusing on ourselves first. And then our heart has a field, no different than I wouldn't go up and grab that electrical wire because there's a field there. We've got mad for a reason. Our heart has that too in a positive way. So we don't even have to say anything. It's really just the way that we personally are acting and the way we personally are feeling. Our rhythms affect others. Anybody who's spent a lot of time around dogs knows that dogs pick up and that has been shown in the science. Dogs pick up on these rhythms, you know, or babies pick up on these rhythms. Anybody who's a parent knows when you are upset and you are stressed, if you have a, a young child, they're going to be impacted by that. So it's really that human factor and starting those conversations of, you know, hey, tell me about home, what's going on? And as soon as you peel that onion, people will start to share. And then it's an easier conversation down the road. Yeah, just, just to build off of that too, you know, techniques that, that I use and techniques that we've trained a lot of our trainers is when you're going into a situation, a lot of times we're working with clients that we might not have a history with, we don't necessarily know. So it's important that we're calm and we're stable first. It's sort of like when you're on a plane, I do a lot of air, well, I used to do a lot of air travel, right? They say, oh, for the plane is going to be plummeting out of the sky, oxygen masks are going to drop. And before you help anybody else, put your oxygen mask on first. You got to have coherence first, right? So whatever it is, you know, for me, I use these heart math techniques. I also use other techniques, not pushing the limit, not like working at an eight or 12 hour day and then going and working out in the gym and then eating dinner at like 10 o'clock at night and then only sleeping for four hours and expecting you're going to do that the next day. 
we've got to take and build into our, our lives, you know, find some sort of sense of resilience, whatever that looks like that can help renew us. The team dynamic becomes so important. And this is really where a lot of people are struggling because social distancing, what it does is it shuts that off, right? If we can't see or we can't communicate the same way that we used to be able to, you're missing out. There's a lot of nonverbal communication that takes place, you know, body language, tone, all these other things that are so very important. And we can do it through a screen a little bit, but really it's best done person to person. So I think right now with the tree care industry is very much that community basis and they work in small teams. You know, those small teams work together really, really well. And it's maintaining that sense of connection, even while trying to comply with all the other guidelines. You know, we can still pick up the phone. We can still reach out. We've heard more stories about, hey, I've lost contact with that person. All of a sudden I reached out through this COVID crisis. Rebuilding those sense of connection, that's also a way to improve resiliency. You feel good, you know, you reconnected with that person and, and that can be a really positive thing. That's awesome. And I think the answer to this question may uh, spin off or be similar is what's a gr good way to discuss a near miss incident? Um, an incident doesn't necessarily occur, but um, could have or been pretty close to happening. Yeah, well, just that term, one of our, our instructors there, our director of uh, instructor and curriculum development, Mr. Tony Tressel, I love his approach. He goes, it's not a near miss, it's a near hit. You nearly got hit, right? Something didn't miss you, it almost hit you. So I think reframing that, you know, maybe throwing a little cognitive dissonance in there, looking at it a little bit differently. Hey, you know, the big thing is lessons learned, right? So right now through COVID, nobody's ever experienced this sort of situation before. And oftentimes when we find ourselves in both complicated and complex environments, the only way that you can correlate cause and effect is after the fact. What that essentially means is the only way you're gonna learn is you're gonna learn through failure, right? As an industry, we've been learning through failure for a very long period of time. But, but just by sharing stories and maintaining that strong connection at the crew level, and then for business owners, I think finding ways within your organization to, to have your organization work like a network because it works very much the same way as the human nervous system so they can share and cross share information. Oftentimes when near misses come up, it's the blame and shame game, right? People feel bad about saying anything, but if it's a culture of openness, people do make mistakes. We're human, right? That's one of our beauties and it's also one of our challenges is we are just human. I think it's about, you know, it comes all the way to the top too. It's about encouraging that culture of openness, encouraging that team dynamic, encouraging that network and really looking at it as a positive, right? This almost happened to me and we don't want it to happen to you. Okay, carrying that narrative out. Amanda, Amanda anything else that you wanna add on that? Yeah, being very careful with the narrative of that. So we can all, we've all experienced a near miss in our life uh, or a near hit, you know, in a car, you know, whoa, I almost, and then we all know what that feels like. Heart is racing and, so we need, to, we need to stop and collect ourselves and do what we need to do to discharge that energy. So some people need to you know, run around. Some people need to do something to discharge. Some people shake as a way of discharging the energy. There's a lot we can learn from an animal situation, predator-prey situation, where a prey survives and they move and discharge all this energy. So most importantly, let the person do what they need to do bring their heart rate down and then they're comfortable and then coming back together, be very cautious with the, use, with the use of the word should. You should have done this. There's a lot, that's a huge trigger. What could have been done differently? What did we learn? Really focusing on the lessons because if shame comes in, oftentimes we don't mean for shame to come in, but that triggers a lot of people. What's then gonna happen is they're gonna stay stuck in their head and everything that we just talked about is gonna actually increase the risk of it happening again. And so there's a lesson, we always say there's a lesson in the mess. Let's focus on the lesson and not the person. So being cautious with even putting the person in the situation um, and just talking about the lesson. Awesome. Um, as a coffee lover, I'm curious to answer, or hear the answer to this question. Um, how does caffeine affect the HRV? Yeah, talk about your hot racing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so, okay, so caffeine itself does not, they've done multiple research studies, it doesn't directly impact heart rate variability. So from the heart rate variability question, um, it's hard to see a correlation with the research. However, remove ourselves from that. What coffee does to us, or what caffeine does, I should say, I shouldn't say coffee, what caffeine does to us is it facilitates a cortisol release to get us going. 
So, you know, we have this idea that cortisol is a bad thing, but when we look at cortisol trends throughout the day, we're supposed to be highest in the morning. That's part of what's called our circadian rhythm. So when our circadian rhythm is off, our cortisol is highest at night, which keeps us from sleeping. And then in the morning when my cortisol is low, then I need the caffeine to induce that. So, you know, I get the question um, a lot as a functional genomic consultant, we can see how people metabolize caffeine. That's where the answer lies. If somebody is a fast metabolizer of caffeine, meaning they say, oh, I can drink a pot of coffee and go to bed, probably not gonna impact them enough. If somebody is like, oh, I could take my coffee or leave it. Um, and if I drink coffee after four o'clock, it keeps me up. That's a person who wants to be cautious. It has to do with their own personal metabolism, how quickly they go to the caffeine to stop that cortisol response. But if you're a caffeine lover and you feel like you don't have to have it, um, I would say enjoy it. I love my coffee. It's one thing you would never be able to take away from me. However, in order to have the, the best effect on circadian rhythm, try to stop it before noontime because you don't want to be inducing that cortisol in the afternoon. Great question. Well, uh, this looks like a good, probably a good point to end the session as I don't see any other questions here. So um, I wanted to thank Nats and everyone for participating and be sure to check the TCIA.org COVID-19 page for updates and also the Nats website for in more info on this webinar and also uh, all their other great programming. So happy Memorial Day to everybody and enjoy the weekend. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thanks everybody.